the next uh, speaker, speakers uh, are from GNU Taylor, an online payment system. Um, our guests and speakers are Christian Grothoff, Jeff Burgess, and Serenity. So enjoy this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to present. Um, let's start with a bit of a motivation. So, in 1971, the American think tank, the Rand Institute, was asked, suppose you were an advisor to the head of the KGB, the Soviet secret police. Suppose you're given the assignment of designing a system for the surveillance of all citizens and visitors within the boundaries of the USSR. The system is not to be too obtrusive or obvious. What would be your decision? Anybody know what the design is they came up with? It's not the internet, hint. <laughs> yes, they pretty much proposed a design that is remarkably similar to modern credit card systems. So welcome to the USSR. Or as some of our friends put it. Yeah. Uh, so um, to quote Snowden, uh, I think one of the big things that we need to do is we need to a way uh, to move away from true name payments on the internet. The credit card payment system is one of the worst things that happened for the user in terms of being able to divorce their access from their identity. So, it's not just that the credit cards have numbers. It's the idea that you need to prove who you are in order to pay. That's the problem. Well, that's a social problem. But it turns out also our friends in the banking industry, they also have a problem called 3D Secure or Verified by Visa. Right, so it's a very complicated process. You've all probably suffered through it by now. Uh, the main feature that it had when it was introduced was saying, OK, with the old credit card payment system, we just have to type in the numbers. You as the merchant are liable. If we do this new thing where you, know, you have to enter your SMS receive pin or some other things, then we can shift the liability to the customer. So that's the main new feature that they introduced. Um, introduce a significant latency, so if you want to do a credit card payment process, if you can do this under 30 seconds, you are really, really good. Um, it can refuse valid payments, at least me, who I'm traveling a lot, I you know, frequently get, well, payment refused, you're in the wrong country, what on earth are you doing in the Netherlands? Um, legal vendors can be excluded, so uh, various uh, legal shops have been told, well, we're not going to process your credit card payments anymore, you're bad, for P bad PR for us, or governments don't like you. Um, and of course, as a buyer, you have no privacy. So this will be replaced simply because the technology is so awful. The big question is with what? So there's, a, the, um, the, there's one proposal, a family of proposals running around, uh, which are that um, the big payment, uh, the, the, the big tech companies will do this for us. Uh, essentially, so, you know, Amazon or Apple or Google or somebody like this will impose a payment system through their software, uh, through their software and hardware platform, and uh, and people will just use it because it's very convenient. Um, the, so essentially, this is creating another oligopoly. It uh, it doesn't address any of the financial, con uh, any of the uh, privacy concerns. If anything, it makes them. It potentially makes them worse because the. Uh, the banks haven't really figured out how to use a lot of this information. They just now sell it to Google. Um, the, uh, and it's, but it's also, it is somewhat worse in the sense that it, it's, it loses what kind of federation they already have. Um, and it means, to some extent, even fewer points of failure. There's also another proposal out there, of course, is the blockchain world with bitcoins, um, where the main feature that is often proposed is saying, well, we don't need all of this banking regulation. Uh, interesting technology. It has a huge advantage that it's actually implemented in free software, unlike most of, our, of the rest of our banking system, right? Try to get the source code for a visa. Um, it's actually free software. You can actually look at it. It's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment system. Um, but as any payment system, it has to solve a simple problem, which is Byzantine consensus. We have a bunch of parties that are possibly ill-behaved, very likely malicious because it's about money, and they have to agree on our balances. Right? That's Byzantine consensus. We have to have an agreement among parties that are not necessarily trustworthy, and they have to agree on who has how much money. 
And that's fundamentally a, an expensive problem to solve. Yeah. Um, and the Bitcoin people solved this by tying initial accumulation. How do I distribute Bitcoins initially by to solving this consensus problem? Yeah, so the, um, the okay, so the the our idea was to make it co um, competitive for advan um, for ad adding new transactions to this letter ledger, but of course, um, so the uh, this is results in an extremely expensive system, and even if you could somehow solve the proof of work problem, just the distributing all the information to every to you know to some fraction, of substantial fraction of the nodes is extremely expensive. So even just the blockchain itself. Yeah, uh, the scaling problem is already there, even if you can magically make the proof of work go away. Uh, so it's extremely expensive banking. And of course, the other thing is... And it, here's, uh, well, well, here's the example yeah. of, of it being extremely expensive. I mean, the current average transaction value on the blockchain is about $1,000. This is not being used for normal purchases. The transaction fees for a transaction, or the average transaction fee is something like... Or, uh, is something like Three dollars a transaction. Yeah. So the last if, you, I heard. if you include the mining reward, so effectively how much carbon dioxide is being burned per transaction, you get to like three dollars per transaction. And it will and be it, worse in the future. Yeah, it has been worse in the past too. But the other thing is, it doesn't solve the privacy problem. So on Bitcoin, all the transactions are public and linkable, uh, so I, the state can trace them. They might be able to find out who your account is. They might not. So we neither have the strong accountability where I can say, okay, this is not going to be used for illegal things. So it's kind of great for extortion. On the other hand, as a citizen, if I use it, there's no guarantee that you know, the rest of the world won't know forever what everything I've done on Bitcoin has, is about. So of course, it has been enhanced with laundering services to better protect our privacy. And there's also cryptographic attempts to, uh, in, to, to enhance it, um, the, the, the strongest of which is the zero cash system, uh, which... Um, uses some fairly, uh, fairly advanced uh, cryptography to hide the identity and the value of transactions. Um, it w works... Uh, In a bit. It, the, I think a zero-cash poor transaction, so an anonymous zero-cash transaction, takes about two minutes on your computer to just to set up the transaction, to, to do just the he very heavy-duty cryptography to get it um, ready to go. So it's a very advanced crypto, but it's... Uh, Slow. So right now we basically have two choices. We can have a libertarian economy, right? Great for extortion, money laundering, all of these things. No, no regulation, uh, and rather expensive. Um, or we can have this total surveillance apparatus built by the credit card system. Which one do you pick? Well, uh, we try to provide you with a third choice, uh, namely Gnutala, um, which is uh, based on an old idea of DigiCash, but with a bit more modern cryptography added. Um, that's supposed to provide a privacy-preserving system, so when you spend money, you have privacy. Um, but when you receive money, we call it taxable because your income is visible to the state. So the state can say, was this a legal transaction and did you pay your you know, taxes on it? And of course, uh, we want to make it practical and extremely efficient compared to all of the other solutions so your transactions go over qu quickly. All right. So, okay. So, it, uh, we're going to be using electronic coins stored in wallet software, which will be an extension in the browser or something else. Um, it's effectively going to act uh, very much like cash, and we'll be paying in uh, we'll be paying in existing currencies, so euro, U.S. dollars, or bitcoins if you want. If you want to have, you can use this to make much cheaper bitcoin transactions. So, like a side chain. And you can, and it's also because everything will be free software and reasonably straightforward. It would be, re it will be relatively easy to roll out a, uh, roll this out for some sort of regional currency or, or something else, something else, uh, any kind of thing where you need some sort of transaction system, whether in regular money or funny money. The high-level view of the system is you have the exchange, which is like the payment service provider, which allows the customers to withdraw coins using a process involving blind signatures. So the exchange does not know which customer got which coin. The customer can then spend the coins at merchants, and the merchants have to pretty much immediately online deposit the coins at the exchange. 
So because this last leg here has to be done online, this is only an online payment system. It will not work if you're offline in the sense of you can't talk to the exchange. Of course, it can work if you have a community and the rest of the world has gone dark. You can still pay within your community if the exchange runs within your community. All right, so the, uh, we're building on, so we, the idea is we'll build on top of, an, we use the existing wire transfer uh, network. The, um, there can be some aggregation in this or whatever, but mm. so the general idea is um, we have a customer and they want to be able to make purchases. So what they do is they first create an account with some exchange, uh, install the wallet software, create an account. And then they, what they do is they tell their bank to fund this account by doing a, in Europe, in the in US, this would be an ACH payment. In Europe, it would be a SEPA payment. The SEPA payments, are, I think, are about four cents if you buy them for the way uh, companies buy them. And for most uh, customers, most SEPA payments, at least as far as I know, in Europe, SEPA payments, the cost tends to get hidden these days, so you don't see it. Um, the, okay, so. That's once the money has arrived at the exchange, then the customer can withdraw, can withdraw coin, their, their wallet will, will withdraw coins, um, and these, these coins are blinded. So the interactions that uh, they're doing here will be cryptographically unlinkable to whatever else they do in the system. Um, and while the coins exist, effectively, exchange has an escrow account within the banking system to kind of store the value in the existing banking system. Right. So when the uh, customer finds some merchant that they want to buy something from and they spend the coins, the merchant uh, immediately runs uh, this deposit operation with the exchange, and the exchange may or may not aggregate those payments, but at some point uh, they, they pay the merchant's bank account, and the, um, but the merchant knows as soon as they've done the deposit operation successfully that they're going to get paid. And, um, the, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. To make it a bit less abstract, uh, Serenity is now going to give you a, te a demo of the system, um, a live demo against the real system. You can also go to this web page with an appropriate browser and do it yourself there. But is my mic, uh, okay, my mic is on. I don't want to test that. <laughs> so first of all, um, I'm going to... Install the wallet. No. no. What? Wallet. You Did I ever Demo. <laughs> try, try, yeah. Wrong link. Uh, click on introduction. That's what. There we go. La la la. Okay, installation is compatible. <laughs> Audio, Torsten. Okay, so um, second of all, you're gonna get get an account. So you're gonna first of all click on bank, and then will ask you for your login. You can either log in if you already have an account or register if you don't. Right. Um, by the way, if you want to get, uh, get this account, username is chat 2017 password is the same. Like everything else here. <laughs> it's chat 2017 <laughs> Never. We're using a funny money for this because it's just It's just demo. because for the demonstration. Torsten, you have to say what you were doing. You accepted the fees that so the payment service provider is going I accepted the fees to withdraw some coins. Now, 4 minus 4 equals 0, obvious. Withdraw approved. And now you can see in my wallet if I click here. 19.8 kudos. And this is just the current demo currency. And, and meaning that the um, withdrawal fees with 0 0.2 kudos. Now, we're going to go to the Easy Shop or whatever it's called, I don't remember. And we're going to pay for a chapter of Richard Stallman's book, Free Software, whatever it's called. Okay. 
I'm the, not going to bother reading the, right now. The payment came up just automatically. In, the, in that set, particular setting, the payment came up automatically. So just clicking on the link was... In case you missed it, he just paid, right? It's easy to miss. <laughs> Torsten, can you do it again slowly? Because I think it's a bit too fast for the audience. Okay, then I'm just going to click Buy another on article, one. okay. Confirm so Here's payment. the contract being shown. Uh, and he paid, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> slowly, Torsten. <laughs> They're used to credit card payments. They're supposed to take a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. a lot of why it can be this fast is because you. <laughs> you're not providing any, we're not providing any identity But there's one thing left. You no, can no. donate. Don't do the donations. We don't have time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's so so uh, I'll just point out that much of why it can be that Convenient is just because we're not providing any identity information. You don't have to think about, do I want to type my name into this website? You just go. I was actually asked by a representative of Deutsche Bundesbank, so said, we're going to require two-factor authentication in the future. Where do you do two-factor authentication? I said, well, I own the hardware. It's my notebook, one factor. And I have my username and password to my account on that machine. That's second factor. I mean, it's the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cash, basically. That's the point. OK, so what are the impacts of this? So first of all, it's a, you know, finally a free software payment system. right? And because your income is going to be transparent, it's going to be very hard to be corrupt in that kind of system. right? And, you know, Schäuble can no longer say, you know, we didn't ever got this money. Um, it's highly efficient. We need a couple of cryptographic signatures, a couple of database entries, so transactions, as you see, they go through really fast. You know? um, and of course, very comfortable to use because you just you know, need one mouse click. We had people say it's maybe a bit too easy to spend your money with the system. You might get rid of all of it. So, uh, protects your privacy. And we are planning on using it to also uh, provide accountability on network usage. So, I can use micropayments. Say, so you want to access my web service, I'm currently under attack, attach a couple of you know, fractions of a cent, and then I don't have to show you a captcha, for example. Yeah. Um so we mentioned something about regional markets, and we'll say a little bit more about that. Um, the, it can also be deployed in a, variety of, in, in a variety of special situations for kids and other things like that. Um, it should be better for competition as well, because since the exchange software, everything is GPL'd, uh, we, the idea would be that there will be multiple competing uh, services that can uh, lower prices this way. The other thing is the system is good against discrimination and for accessibility because the exchange does not have a contract with the merchant beforehand. The exchange says, I'm going to issue coins, and I'm going to redeem them at whatever merchant you're going to spend them. There's no protocol where the exchange can say, I refuse to deal with WikiLeaks. You can't. Right? The regulator says, you issue coins, you better pay them up. Right? So because there is no, no, no such prior agreement, you can't discriminate. We're going to really establish banking again as a neutral thing. Right, like network neutrality, we need banking neutrality. We can't have Google decide to say, oh, we're not going to deal with you. Right? We need a neutral platform, and the protocol ensures this in this case. Because it's free software, the wallet can be there to educate you about your expenses. It keeps a transaction history for you. It can help you analyze where you spend your money. It can warn you about your spending too much. Because it's a free software wallet, we as a community can enhance these features and make sure that the wallet provides us with tools for financial responsibility, not for, uh, for a way to drain us of our money as quickly as possible. And of course, because it's free software running on my computer, I can tailor it to my needs. So if I have accessibility needs, I might have a wallet that's really tailored to my specific abilities and usability requirements. Want to say more? No. OK, let's okay. go over some use cases. Yeah, so First okay. use case. Today, when you're a journalist, you're typically working in some big corporate structure. right? And the big corporate structure is there because you, your main source is not selling your articles, but advertising. Right? And that means, of course, that the publishers also have to track the readers so that they can tailor the advertisement. Right? So we have, on the one hand, the drive we need to understand the readers so we can advertise to them. And then, of course, we have the second problem, which is now we have advertising content and journalistic content. And they're really next to each other, produced by kind of the same entity. Right? So is it now advertisement or is it extra journalism? Very hard to distinguish the two. Yeah, so the idea with Toller, what would happen is you, we can do one-click micropayments like we just showed with the demo, 
Um, so you can simply run a blog and get paid. Uh, you don't need a, uh, the payments can be quite small because the, the, the transaction fees can be really small. Um, the, uh, there, you don't, it's relatively easy to set up. Um, they won't be, if you do it in this kind of, in this form, it doesn't have to be linked to any sort of, uh, other corporate apparatus or advertising and your readers can remain, remain, can remain anonymous, which seems like it might be relevant in the case of journal publishing journalism. Um, yeah. Another case is we have lots of people that today are effectively discriminated against by the banking system, either because they don't have the right papers, they don't have a, an address where they can be registered. Um, this in particular applies to refugees, but also, of course, to kids. Um, and so if you have these non-bankable people, well, they can't use money as an easy way of doing exchange and running an economy. Um, as a result, uh, they are mostly directly dependent on direct aid. Right? There's not really you know, companies that are running in the refugee camps. Uh, even though there's a population that could work. But, but the fact that we're excluding them from our monetary system means that they can't easily work in the way that we usually work. And the result is, of course, that they are highly dependent on this aid. So um, with Holler, it's re relatively easy to spin up a local currency um, or to, uh, to provide some sort of, you can have an, an NGO can provide either a, a local, its own currency or local currency or something else like uh, euros um, as some sort of basic income directly to a group of people, that, a group of refugees or whatever that are, that are running the software on m mobile devices. Um, then you can sort of create a small e economy in that environment, uh, use it be with um, where you have, you know, if necessary, you have taxation for whatever the local businesses, the businesses there are, and you can start to actually use that money to fund a local government. So you can literally, you ha can have the sort of the mechanics of Western banking sort of just up and running uh, in this, yeah, in this. Yeah. And so, so the next camp, I expect us to run a government here, right? <laughs> you know, the badges should be a good starting point. Okay, last use case. Uh, well, today, as you might have seen in Anani's talk, we have pretty easy privacy providing authenticated encryption for email, which is great. It's free software. It's easy to use because of this encryption available for all the platforms, including the proprietary ones. And the great thing is then the spies will no longer be able to inspect the content of our emails. And the not so great thing is, Today, we're relying on spam filters to inspect the contents of emails to suppress the spam. Well, if you have effective end-to-end -end encryption that becomes universal, the spammers will eventually also start to encrypt emails. First, we will herald this as a great success. And then once we get 100,000 of those, we will say, oh, that's a problem. So um, one, apart, one thing that you could do if you want to, if this becomes quite the you know, if, if uh, encrypted e if spam emails become a serious problem, is you could do, um, you can do peer-to-peer -peer -peer email uh, payments in the email, so you can in include a taller payment in the uh, encrypted message, and um, the, the sender, uh, so the sender attaches some payment, and then the receiver can, um, can simply grant a refund to the sender if, they're, if they don't, the receiver's software can simply grant a refund to the sender if they don't click the junk, junk mail button. So th this could work. Uh, we haven't implemented anything like that, of course, but it could be done so with the underlying. Basically, thing. Adam backs all that data of hash cash except for with real cash and without the proof of work. Yeah. Right. I mean, have real income if your spammer sends you spam. OK, let's move a bit on. Uh, towards the technology, but we have to first explain a bit what taxability means in Thaler. Yep. So the high-level idea is, when we say taxable, is when you're a merchant and you receive income through a system that's going to be visible from you depositing the coins at the payment service provider at the exchange, and then, of course, they can say, oh, you got this amount of money. And the contract that you agree to with the uh, customer is going to be embedded, the hash of that is going to be part of the payment. Uh, so that later the state could come to you and say, what was the contract? What did you sell? Is there VAT or is it income or whatever tax is applicable and check that? Uh, the exchange does not see the contract, only sees the hash of the contract because, of course, the contract itself is none of the business of the payment service provider. And because of this, the state can trace transactions whenever you receive money and then apply the right level of taxation. 
We don't say how high the taxes should be, right? but we just say the income is visible to the state who can see the banking system and controls it, not to everybody, and therefore the state can apply taxation. However, there are a couple of loopholes. Yeah, so there's a technical loophole that's kind of hard to avoid that uh, in any, it, hard to avoid in any sane way where if you obviously if you take money out of an ATM you can immediately hand it to somebody else and this is true for us as well. Um, the, uh, the in this case you're essentially doing the withdrawals for them and um, that in principle you there's measures you can imagine, if that actually becomes a problem, there's things you can imagine people doing to try and su suppress it just by looking at the pattern of withdrawals and things like this. Um, and the other thing is that's somewhat more interesting is there's nothing we can do to prevent uh, transfer of coins amongst people that trust each other. So when we say that uh, Tyler is taxable, what we mean is that transactions between people that don't trust each other will be visible to the to the banks of those of those uh, of the recipient of the money. Um, if you're just transferring coins, if you're just giving coins to your brother, there's nothing we can do to stop you from doing that. And um, wow. that uh, that's perhaps. I mean, one way to argue you can argue that this perhaps should be more liberal than it is in uh, today's society, or that's a subtle point, we don't want to get into it, but... Yeah. In, in general, we've met people who basically said all of these limitations are actually features, right, because you might want those. Uh, if I want to give my kid money or my spouse money, it might be a good idea for me just to be able to hand over the electronic coins and not have to have them pay income taxes on it. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's not economic activity as such if it's within a family. Now, all right. Let's talk about the crypto. The high-level point is we're using very, very old crypto, as far as crypto goes, uh, but of course modern instantiation. So we use hash functions, blind signatures, no signatures, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and a cut-and-choose protocol uh, in modern instantiation, but they have well understood old constructions for crypto. Um, this is important because some of the other projects in this area use rather stuff that's like two years old and has not, uh, not as, been as analyzed as well, I would say. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, okay, so one thing, one thing we need that's kind of central is what we call a denomination key. Uh, so this is a key that represents a particular amount of money. So like a, this is a five euro note. So it's a particular RSA key that, that the meaning of this is that the thing signed by this is a five euro bill. And so we create, this is just an ordinary RSA cre uh, key creation. We pick two primes, we multiply them, and then we, uh, to get this N, the product of them is the, uh, the part of the, going to be part of the pu public key. And we take the, the euler tonne function of them, uh, of, of that product, which we can compute because we know the P and Q. And now what we do is we pick this small E, um, less than phi of N, which is usually, usually around 65,000 and we invert it mod phi to the n, and um, then what we do is we publish e and n. So the private key of, an RS, of the RSA key is really d, or in faster algorithms, d and p and q, to get all three together, and then the public key is this e and this pair e and n. So that will be, e and n will be published. Now, to make it a bit simpler, using in pictures, you know, we throw some dice, get some random numbers, create a public key which you're going to represent by a seal, you know, that's saying signed by this public key, and we have a tool, which is the hammer, which allows us to apply the seal to objects, okay? All right, so now we, uh, we also need um, various signing keys. In particular, the merchants need to be able to sign that they're proposing a contract to a user, and um, this we, do with, uh, this we do with ECDSA, which is a particular elliptic curve signature algorithm. So essentially what happens is they pick a, they pick a, a private scalar, actually something else, but actually something they hash into a scalar, but whatever. They pick a private scalar and they multiply it by the, ba by the generator of the curve to get a curve point that represents the public key for that particular merchant. The main upshot is you have some small value M that you created at random and it has, gives you the ability to sign documents with that value, right? Mm -hmm. 
So we also use elliptic, uh, elliptic curve signatures to create, or customers will use uh, elliptic curve signatures with every coin that they, that they buy from the exchange. And so they, they'll, they'll have a different small c, which is, a, which is again, a, a, sca a sca scalar on the curve. And multiply by that, we get this big c guy, which we refer to as the coin's public key. So for each coin, you have a pu private key and a public key. Again, in pictures, we just write this public key, this big C, like a serial number on the coin. A bit hard to see here. And the small C gives us the capability of signing things with the coin. Right? Then we're going to represent like with the seal. Right, so I can sign things with coins. Uh, these are all the keys that we're going to use for now. There are a couple more in the actual system, but I think these are the main things you need for understanding the system. OK, let's get started. All right, so um, the, this is how, this is what's called how we uh, do, uh, this is uh, blind signatures, this is how you withdraw money anonymously. So what you do is you, your wallet will know this, uh, will find or otherwise know the denomination key of the amount of, of the coin that it, uh, value that it wants to withdraw. It computes one of these planchets, it, takes, it makes up a private scalar, comes up, with a, comes up with a big C, which is the curve point corresponding to it, the, the public key for that coin. And what it does is it takes, for technical reasons, a full domain hash of C, and that, it, um, that, is, that is the thing that, it need, that is being, that are taking this full domain hash is the first part of the RSA signature algorithm. And so what it does to have the blind signature is it picks some blinding factor in the integers mod this N, and it, it exponentiates this to that E from the, RSA, uh, from, from the RSA setup, which is the same as encrypting it to this thing that you think of as a signing key. And then you multiply that by this, by this uh, full domain hash F. Um, so that you have this, in, this thing that you've encrypted uh, to the key, and you multiply it by this thing that you want signed, and you send that to the exchange. OK, so in pictures again, basically, you make yourself a random number B, which you're going to use to lock the planchet into an envelope that you can only open kind of with this B value. And otherwise, I can send this envelope to somebody, and they won't know what is in there. So they can't see, in particular, what the serial number of that coin is, because that's what I need to hide. Yeah, so now on the exchanges side, what they do, so they, they receive this uh, blinded planchet and what they want to do, uh, this F prime from the previous slide, and, and they also receive an authorization to take some money out of the, out of the balance that the user has, has, has given them. And so then um, what they do is they run the ordinary RSA signature algorithm, which, which consists of just taking this F prime and exponentiating it to D. And if you think about what that does in terms of the form of F prime, F prime is, was, was, uh, was, um, was F times B to the E, then D distributes over it, so you end up with, uh, you end up with just F to the D times, uh, times, B, uh, times B to the E times D. Or again, put it more simply, you apply the hammer to the envelope without knowing yeah. what's in there yeah. and send it back. So on the user side, when they get back this S prime, which had the form uh, F to the D times, uh, times B to the E times D, well, B to the E times D is just B, so they can multiply it by B inverse, and they get back a signature of the original, of the original guy. So this is, this is how blind signatures work. It was David Chome that came up with this. It's 30 years old. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's exploiting a homo the kind of homomorphic properties of RSA that we usually uh, try and hide uh, and usually try and avoid and the only delicate parts of this are essentially how to how to preserve this homomorphic property and not uh, not um, create some other kind of catastrophes and that we that was why we had that FDH back in the beginning but that's another thing anyway so the main thing is at this point the wallet has the coin and you saw this happening in the demo a bunch of times because 1980 is a bunch of coins in our case now on the web, in the demo, you know, the steps, of course, you have to authenticate yourself to your bank, tell the bank, send the money to the payment service provider. You know, the payment service provider says, okay, well, this is my fee structure, you know, how many coins do you want? Uh, you authorize the transaction with your PIN, TAN check, and eventually you get your coins. Right, so this is just the 
overall diagram for that interaction. Now, the next step is, of course, to go shopping. So the first step is the usual thing. You build yourself some shopping cart at some shop and somehow agree with the merchant on what you might want to buy. Now, at the time when you do the checkout, the merchant has to say, well, what payment method do you want? Uh, we offer two ways of doing this uh, nicely. One, you can, with JavaScript, detect that the Tala wallet is present. Basically, the Tala wallet exposes one bit of information to the website, namely, I'm there or not. So in terms of fingerprinting, it adds one bit to your profile, uh, unless, of course, Tala becomes universal, which we all hope. Uh, second possibility, if you have JavaScript disabled, all of the Tala payments work still with JavaScript disabled, and you can still do something there because we have a CSS tag that you can set or not set to show or hide elements on the web page depending on the Tala wallet being present. So the Tala payment process works completely without JavaScript, but of course you might can do more fancy interactive stuff if JavaScript is there using this method. Then, when you've decided, okay, the user should pay with Tala, uh, what you do is you send a 402 payment required HTTP status back to the browser. Who knew about 402? It's ancient, right? <laughs> and the only thing you have to do, basically, you have to add additional header x Tala contract URL, which is an address where the wallet can obtain the contract in JSON format. Basically saying, this is what you should pay for. And then the body, you can do whatever you want to do in case something goes wrong, like the Tala wallet isn't really there because you failed to detect it properly, or somebody just directly accessed that web page, and maybe you show your normal non-Tala payment process there. The contract itself looks like this. It's basically a bunch of JSON where you specify things like which payment service providers are you willing to deal with, uh, what fees are you willing to cover for the customer, how much is he supposed to pay, how long is the offer valid, what is he buying, all of these basic things are defined in the contract. Anyway, on the cryptographic side, once we have this proposal to do this, the contract, of course, has to include a signature saying, this is what the merchant offered me. So, yeah. We have the proposal D here, that's the JSON, and we're going to sign it. Uh, Merchant key that we saw earlier, that we did second in the, in the yeah. list of keys. And you sign it and send that to the wallet, right? All right, so when the, the, um, the wallet receives this proposal, which is signed by a merchant, um, it, would it, and, it, and the user when the user actually clicks this pay button, what happens is the uh, the wallet will send back um, this uh, the send back the um, three things. So it'll send back the the signature S um, that the exchange gave it that the that it obtained from the S prime the exchange gave it on this big C. And so this what this signature says is that big C is a coin that represents five euros. And then it'll use Big C to sign uh, this to sign this contract that the exchange gave it. Now, of course, it's possible that one coin isn't enough to pay for a contract, and then you just do it with a bunch of coins until they end up to the total value of the contract. Then, what does the merchant do? Well, he basically checks: is the signature correct? Yeah. If it's correct, he passes it on to the payment service provider. The payment service again checks: is the signature correct? And have I seen this coin already? Has there been double spending? Has the guy tried to spend his money twice? If no, I'll accept it and tell the merchant it's all good, sign the exchange. If it's invalid, I have to provide the old uh, uh, purchase as proof that it has been double spent. Again, here's the process uh, in the WC3 payment interest group format. Uh, you basically first negotiate what you want to buy. You Obtain the contract, confirm that you do want to pay, send the payment to the payment service pro, uh, to the merchant who sends it to the payment service provider. The payment service provider confirms it. Uh, you tell the wallet, "Yep, contract went through. By the way, get your product, your business logic, your confirmation page here." And then the wallet goes to that confirmation page. Again, you've seen it happen. Now, there's one All little right. problem with the setup that we've described so far, which is, what if I want to buy something big, All right? Not the you know, 10 cent thing, but maybe something for 100 euros. Now, if I have coins and I want to be able to pay things for 1 cent and things for 100 euros, I don't want to end up doing 10,000 transactions of 1 cent for a 100 euro transaction. That would even with this system take too long because you have to do 10,000 signatures. Now, 
Of course, I can give out different denominations, you know, one cent, two cent, four cent, eight cent, and so on. But it's still, of course, possible that I might have, whatever, a five euro coin, but I want to buy something for three euros. And I shouldn't tell the user, well, you have more money than what you want to buy, but you don't have exact change, so we can't handle it. Right, so how do we deal with giving change? That's yeah. basically the main things that we improved over the original DigiCash. Now, in giving change, we have two key requirements. Yeah, yeah so first of all, um, we need the change to be, uh, w when you obtain the change, uh, whatever change the user obtains, it needs to be unlinkable to this transaction because perhaps they like, you know, gave out their, their real name or their, uh, or their address or something like this in this transaction. And so we don't want the coins that they get back from it to be linkable to it. And we also want to maintain that it's tax, the, 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 this taxability property, which we got sort of from the, bl the way the blind signature scheme works. Uh, OK. The key idea is basically when I sign a contract with a coin, say I sign a contract over three euros with a five euro coin, I say, don't give the merchant the full five euros, only give him three which means the exchange knows that on this coin there's two euros left. And then I can later go to the exchange and kind of double spend the coin saying, please give me change for the two euros that are remaining on that coin. And then I, then I get two additional, say, one euro coins, right? And effectively, now the five euro coin is completely burned. And that's good. Now, of course, there's a problem with that. But let's first give you yeah. a bit more background. So just this is, it's hard to know how much crypto people are in the audience. So this is what a Diffie-Hellman key exchange looks like. So we have uh, two parties and in the classical Diffie-Hellman, there's two parties, but whatever, in whatever setting, there's two private keys, a C and a T. And these are, these are scalars for some elliptic curve. And we multiply those by the generators of the curves to come up with uh, big C and big T, which are points on the curve. So these are the public keys. And now um, this curve is an abelian group, which means that when I, when the order in which I, I, I add things uh, doesn't matter. So um, what I can do is I can take and I can take and I can multiply this little c. The guy who knows the little c can multiply t by itself, can add t to itself c times, which is the same as c times t times g. And this is abelian, so we end up with t times c times, I can reverse the order of these two guys. And that is the same as, as adding this big C to itself t, t many times. So this is, this is how Diffie-Hellman key exchange works. Well, if you want to have a simpler idea, just think of it as a lock with two keys. If you have either of the two keys, you can open it. If you have both, it's of course also possible. All right. So here's our sort of... Uh, straw man solution to this, uh, which we sort of mentioned already. So we have, a, uh, we have this partially spent coin. Um, what we want to do is we want to pull out a new key, a new coin from the re residual balance on that. So what we're going to do is we, we compute this new coin's uh, uh, public key, and we pick a random blinding factor. And from, so we take, again, we take this uh, FDH, this hash of the new coin, and we run through the ordinary uh, blind signature algorithm from it, and we request, uh, we request, except instead of asking that the value be funded from some user's account, we ask that it be funded from the residual value of some partially spent coin. Now, the big problem with that is that I can't show that CNU, the new key, right, that is coming out of this process pretty much looks like the previous withdrawal process. It's actually owned by the same person. So I could say, OK, I had a 100 euro coin. I want to pay him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the exchange, give me change for 99 euros. And he creates the CNU for the new coins, which means he will own them. Only he has the private key. And I sign the change request with my old key. And then I've transferred the value to him. He doesn't have to trust me. He knows he has the private keys. He generated them. He never disclosed them to me. He gets the signatures from the exchange, so he knows he now has valid coins. And he had this as income, and the system thinks, I got change. Right? So that's what we have to prevent. We have to make sure that the owner of CNU is the same as the owner of C old. But because we want to make sure that transactions are unlinkable, 
We have to at the same time make sure that nobody else knows that this public key C new has a relationship to the public key C old. Right? So keep them unlinkable, but make sure they're owned by the same person is the idea. All right. So to do this, um, okay. So what will this? So to do this, we're going to use a, uh, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to derive the new, the C new and the B new. Um, so okay. So what do we do? We we have our, our C old that's partially spent. We now instead of creating the C new, what we do is we create this little t, which is also an elliptic curve scalar, but uh, and we compute a public key that corresponds to it. And we compute this x, which is the result of this Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and we run two key derivation functions on it, uh, which give us a C new and a B new. And then from C new, we, we again compute the, key, the, the, public, the, uh, the public key, and we create this hash, and we, we, and we blind it with the B, and we request that, we request that the exchange signs this. Now, you should be very confused here, uh, certainly because from the exchange perspective, this here, and what we did before, we told you is wrong, looks the same, right? In both cases, I get this envelope that I don't know what's in there. So how do I know that, Jeff, how do I know that this process was followed? The answer is we do it three times. <laughs> so we make up three of these, t these T1, T2, T3. We do each of them getting a different Diffie-Hellman key, key exchange result with the C old. And we send all of them to the exchange. And but then I can just cheat you three times. Well, we're not going to give you three coins for the value of it. We're only going to give you one. And so the exchange picks one of these values that it, uh, it picks one, one, two, or three. And what we do is we send back the, we, we send back the, uh, we send back, uh, it, the user is required to send back this, this private key for the, for the big T for the other, for the others. And then, that, and then the exchange can run through these derivations and check that for the other two, that for the, the other two that it didn't pick, the user did, did the derivation correctly. And if they did, then they can run through the, the finish, the, then they can finish the protocol. But that means I can cheat you one out of three times successfully just by guessing. Isn't that not quite cryptographic security, Jeff? One, one in three times means that your tax rate will have to be uh, more than 66% to be able to do any tax evasion with this. So if my tax rate is 70%? Then you do it four times. 80%? Do it five times. Okay, so it stays rather small, the number of times I have to do this in the cut and choose protocol for sane tax rates. Okay, so I've done this correctly. You've checked this. Yeah. And then I get my coin. Right? I've proven that I've done this correctly. Now, at this point, I could have still run this with the person who wants to invade their taxes. Right? It can still be that all of these transfer private keys were known to somebody else. So I got the coin, but I have to now still make sure that the new coin is owned by the same person. So what the exchange does, it says, OK, if, I, if somebody gives me the old coin's public key, I'm going to also hand out the envelope and the transfer public key. It's just a little. You know, exchange volunteering some information that's usually pretty harmless. And if I'm the one who owns the old coin, I have the private key of the old coin. I can also do the Diffie-Hellman with the transfer public key. And I can also derive the new coin's private key and the blinding factor and can open the envelope. So this basically means that the owner of the old coin has kind of a backdoor into the Diffie-Hellman and can also reconstruct the private key of the new coin this way. And we know from the cut and choose that it was constructed properly, which means that now, if there were two parties, both have all the private keys and signatures, which means we've reduced this possibility of a transfer of money to this case where we're sharing private keys, which we could have just done directly. You know, we're back in the situation where we have to trust each other in terms of who can spend it. All right. Um, okay, so the... Um so we have this, we, uh, so the customer asks the exchange to convert a new coin to the old key. The, the protocol ensures the, uh, the new coin, via this last step, the protocol ensures that the new coins can always be recovered by the old, from the old ones. And, it, and this implies uh, that the new coins are in some sense owned by the same entities that owned the old ones. Uh, in, if, where ownership is sort of determined by this possession of the key. 
uh, or the ability to get the key. So um, the refresh. Can, yeah. yeah, we can use this protocol to give change. We can also use it to give refunds. Basically, if the merchant signs give the money back to the customer, it's just added back to the balance of the coin. The customer refreshes the coin, he has change, uh, uh, has a refund. If we have to expire coins, we can just basically say this coin will expire in two years. If your wallet detects that it's about to expire, it just runs the refresh protocol, gets a new coin, and we can forget about the old keys, don't have to keep an ever growing ledger like in Bitcoin. Um, and of course, if the protocol has an, encounters an abort situation where the network goes down and they need to remember uh, uh, unlinkable, I can also just say, OK, the tran merchant, the transaction didn't complete, but I can back out by running the refresh protocol and have my coin back in a new state that is fresh and unlinkable to the aborted transaction. So to compare the system with other things, as you see, uh, compared to cash, you know, we don't work offline. We only work online. Uh, the transaction costs are extremely low. Payments are extremely fast. We do support taxation uh, very well because income is very easily visible to the state. Uh, we have anonymity for whoever buys something, but no privacy for whoever receives money. Um, we, of course, would claim this is the most secure system of all of them. We do not have conversion here saying we do, you don't have to convert, right? With Bitcoin, you have to create a new currency. Here, you can pay in euros, you can pay in dollars. You don't add a conversion risk for the user or a conversion cost. And, of course, it's a free software project, part of GNU. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, we have all sorts of uh, information. There's lots of documentation and other, the source code, of course, is plenty. Um, we have relatively good documentation on the, the specifications for the protocols and things like this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else. Yeah, and I should mention, uh, this is a GNU package that is going commercial, so we are actually also looking to build the business around it. So if you happen to have a couple of million euros lying around, please talk to us. <laughs> or, or run a bank. If you run a bank, that's almost more useful. A bank will be better, yes. <laughs> okay. To conclude, we have the choice. We can suffer mass surveillance from the credit card oligopolies or the big payment providers like Google, Apple Pay, and so on. Uh, we can, as a society, engage in an arms race with unregulatable blockchains and have our ransomware uh, extort us. Um, or, of course, we can enjoy the benefits of cash, like in India, where they sometimes don't have cash even for offline payments. Or you can help us build Taler and establish a payment system that balances the social goals of transparency and privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, any questions? Be careful. Be careful. Any careful. questions? So Serenity is taking over my uh, job. <laughs> so come on. Come over here. <laughs> so, yeah. Go on. Do you have any questions? Yes. Hi. I would like to ask, uh, do you, so the original Charms East Cash has this nice property of if you spend twice the same coin, that your anonymity gets revoked. So we do, so there's a big problem with those schemes. There's a huge literature on sort of expanding on those schemes. Uh, the reason for doing that is to allow offline spending and specifically to allow the merchant to be offline. So in our scheme, the user can be offline much of the time. The merchant needs to be online. Uh, the reason we don't want to do anything like that is because is if you think about just managing the system, it's almost impossible to imagine that, that uh, that double spending will never happen. Like it, restoring from backups, all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of failure modes where double spending is just going to happen by mistake. So um, if you have that kind of system where you de-anonymize the user, it, it's not, it's very, the, the, the sort of the, the privacy properties for the user at that point are very hit or miss. And so it, it's really not acceptable if you want to say your system is really private. And, uh, so, so it's dangerous for privacy, that's one thing. But the other thing is, from the business point of view, if you double spend a coin, you can also, you know, billion spend the same coin, and now you owe me a billion dollars because I have, after the fact, offline, detected that you double spend. Now I have to go after you and recover the billion dollars that you obviously don't have, right? So it's not like being able to de-anonymize you gives me an easy way as the operator to get my money back. Yeah, you're essentially So it's running. a huge business risk to 
the anonymize and then go after the people. One and of that the, cost, we just don't want to pay. One of the advantages of something like Taller is because it's acting as a thin layer on top of, a, on top of SEPA payments, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't incur, there's no, nothing like all of the nasty collection stuff that has to go on in a credit card. And, this, and then it's those things that initially made credit cards very expensive. So we avoid all that and we don't have that initial that cost. So this already seems really compelling for the retail scenarios where I've used Bitcoin so far. It seems like it would be better for me. But uh, I do like one or two chargebacks a year. I like almost take a glee in it. It's my favorite thing about credit cards. So would you come closer to the mic? Yeah, continue. If I had to choose between being anonymous and being able to do a chargeback if the merchant screwed me and have the credit cards company like negotiate with me, I'm not sure which one I'd pick. So I wonder if you thought about the chargeback path and if you could yeah, factor so it out of the crypto. I'm sympathetic to that. It sounds like I don't do as many chargebacks as you do, but I have done them at a few points in my life and you, there's a very nice feeling of, okay, I'm in charge when you do that. Um, the, w w there is a system for refunding and the merchant has given, the merchant has to choose to refund in the scheme that, we're, that we have. And, and uh, the, um, so the, the mechanics of doing a refund work, and in fact, they can, the refunds can be done anonymously to, so the customer can get their money back without having to re reveal anything about their identity. Um, in the scheme, the way we envision it working is that the, uh, the merchant would have to authorize the refund because there's simply not money in the system otherwise. It's not impossible to imagine that the exchange could do some sort of arbitration there, but now you're asking the exchange to do this expensive arbitration process. And realistically, all of the schemes that people are t seriously talking about deploying that's what they're getting rid of, is this arbitration process. Here's the I other mean, thing. You Apple Pay, all of these things, it's that, you know, the, the, um, uh, the 3D Secure, all of these things, they reduce, the whole point is to reduce the customer's ability to object so that there's less risk for the merchant yeah. there. The good thing is you have cryptographic proof of the operation. And if you want to have this kind of arbitration process, you could, of course, say, I'm not going to pay the merchant directly, but some arbitration process operator that is going to hold the funds in escrow until I you know, decide it's all good. Uh, so that would be a separate service. Just if you really need this arbitration at the extra cost it imposes, then buy it and add it on top as an extra layer. So I guess you're saying that in the architecture you proposed, the exchange could unilaterally decide to do a refund. No. No, it uh, well, it can give you back. Your, you have the signatures. It can give you back the money. Like, it it can put the money back on the, the coin. To, no, you get the signature from the merchant that authorizes the refund. Yeah, okay. And you, don't, you have no way of knowing who is the right customer. I mean, but ultimately, it's the exchange <coughs> who decides what the money is on the coin. Anyway, the exchange shouldn't be an ar arbitration. If you want an arbitration service, build it separately would be my answer. Okay. Okay, next question. Hello, hello. hello. My name is Pavel. Um, I have a bit of ideological question. Okay, so I'm crypto anarchist, and I so it means that I believe that crypto anarch, um, like cryptocurrencies, are here just to provide us completely new kind of personal and economical freedom. And this is this is not only me, but Satoshi uh, thought the, the similar idea. Uh, I mean, the control not only over corporation, but even the government. So my when I, when I fr firstly heard about anonymous, uh, anonymous uh, tax, uh, taxable money, it sounded for me like a big joke, you know. Uh, but so my question is, you have a lot of different competitive currencies, cryptocurrencies. And my question is, uh, how do you want to persuade people to use government-friendly cryptocurrency Without the, coercion or this is, like not, one, a this is not a cryptocurrency. Oh, okay, okay. This okay. is a transaction the system. System. The system. Okay. Okay. But anyway, so my question is, how people will voluntarily use the system without law or without forcing people to use the system? 
So people use credit cards without law. People use PayPal without law. Why shouldn't they use Tala without a law requiring them? I mean, it has advantages so for them in terms uh, of privacy. One, and the one thing that's I think that we should I should point out here when we say that it's taxable, yeah. we're create what we're doing is we're con we're converting. We're, take, we're saying that our system does not reduce the government's ability to monitor transactions relative to what the underlying transaction system provides. Mm -hmm. If you run Taller on top of Zcash, you will have very cheap transactions and nothing will be traceable. But, yeah, but for example, I you have to run it on top of, an, if you run it on top of SEPA payments, yeah. it will have the same properties as SEPA payments. In terms, of in terms of taxation, if you run on top of Zcash, it will have the same properties as Zcash. Okay, uh, okay. we have to stop. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, um, no more? Quit. No, no, no. Okay. We'll, we'll be here uh, for the rest of the day. Please come find us. Yeah. Um, and we'll be happy to answer your questions offline. Thank you. Yeah.